I'm Michael O'Toole, crime correspondent with The Star. Welcome to another episode of our podcast series focusing on the trial of Jerry the Monk Hutch. Here's our usual recap before we start. Mr Hutch is on trial at the non-jury special criminal court in the CCJ in Dublin. He is charged with the murder of David Byrne at the Regency Airport Hotel in north central Dublin on the 5th of February 2016. He denies that charge. Two men are on trial alongside him, Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy, are charged with helping a crime gang carry out the murder by providing with the cars. Neither is charged with the murder itself. But like Mr Hutch, they deny the charges and all three are now on trial. Joining me now to discuss another day of state witness, Jonathan Dowdall's evidence, is Paul Healy. Hello Paul. How's it going? Can we just, before uh, we go any further, I've spent the day um, covering the sad murder of Private Sean Rooney. And it's a terrible tragedy for the people of Ireland and for the Defence Forces. We're very lucky to have the Defence Forces and we'd just like to pass on our condolences to all, to Private Rooney's family and all his uh, friends and Absolutely. colleagues. And we also hope and pray that Trooper uh, Shane Kearney recovers from his injuries. It's a very sad day for Ireland and it's a very sad day for the Defence Forces. And I know that an awful lot of Defence Forces serving and ex exers ex-members of the Defence Forces listen to the podcast. We're, we're just thinking of everybody involved with the Defence Forces today. Absolutely. So, uh, Paul, today's uh, evidence, what happened? Yeah, well, today was another dramatic day in court with Jonathan Dowdall. You never quite know what exactly is going to come out of his mouth and you never quite know how uh, lively the exchange is going to be. I would say that today Jonathan Dowdall was uh, quite irked at times, um, bothered more so than even he was yesterday by questions he was being asked and by uh, the route uh, that we were going down in relation to um, in relation to a, a tape that was being played to him. So I'll just explain this, that we got to a point today where Brendan Graham, Senior Counsel for Mr. Hutch, wanted to play um, a video uh, recording of an interview that Jonathan Dowdall had with Gardy in May of 2016. And so we were played this. Uh, you can see Jonathan Dowdall uh, being interviewed by two members of Gardy Shiakana. Um, uh, and it's fascinating to watch this because you can then compare the Jonathan Dowdall on this tape to the one that's sitting in front of us in the courtroom um, in terms of his body language and the way that he's going on and the questions he's been asked and the way that he's answering them. Um, look, obviously, the, the defense are playing this because they're, they, it suits their narrative in terms of saying that Jonathan Dowdall is a liar. Because throughout this interview with Gardy, Dowdall makes a number of claims that he is now, uh, and has already over the past number of days, directly contradicted, said the complete opposite thing. Um, just to recap, the prosecution's case against Jerry Hutch is that Jerry Hutch confessed to Jonathan Dowdall in a park in Whitehall in Dublin, where he said that uh, he was one of the team involved in the Regency, uh, that he and Mago Gately shot David Byrne in the Regency Hotel. Uh, throughout this interview with Gardy, Jonathan Dowdall said that Jerry Hutch would never, can, uh, would never tell him about the Regency, would never tell him about the murder. Um, and, and that he wasn't the type of person that would ever talk about criminality with anybody, uh, let alone him. Um, so that's remarkable. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and we knew the second that we heard that, that Brendan Gretton was going to grill Jonathan Dowdall throughout the day today um, in relation to that. And can I just ask, Paul, <clears throat> what was uh, Mr. Dowdall's demeanour in the video? So in the interview room with the two detectives, was he cocky? Was he nervous? Was he worried? How, how did he come across? To me, he seemed quite confident. Um, he, yeah, like at times in the courtroom, he pauses to think before he says something. Then he could go off on a tangent. As I said, he can ramble and really go off the subject and talk and talk and talk. And he has to be brought back to the question he's been asked. But, um, and, and you could see a bit of that in the interview with the guards. But uh, I just, there was a, an air of confidence about him. Um, you know, in this case, Jonathan Dowdall appears to be trying to help the Gardaí or is portraying himself that he is trying to help the guards. Um, you know, he, he was a respected counsellor in the inner city. People knew him. People came to him to talk to him and confide in him. And he said that one of these people was Jerry Hutch. 
just to bring context to this, because there's a lot in it, but the context of this is that Jonathan Dowdle was about to leave the country. We hear he was trying to go to Dubai, interesting, of all places, uh, in May 2016. That that struck me as strange. Yeah, sorry, that struck me as really strange because uh, it's no secret we knew about the, the, the search of Jonathan Dowdle's house. And I remember the night we were told about the search happened and I was told, yeah, and he was arrested at Dublin Airport. I, I don't think he was arrested at Dublin Airport, but they knew he was going to Dubai. So sometimes we get information, but... You know, when I heard about him going to Dubai, just obviously the context there is that Dubai, even then, was Daniel Kinahan's bolt hole. So I, it just struck me as really strange that he's trying to get out of Ireland and he goes to where the, the Kinahans are are effectively, you know, headquartered. So that, that, that struck me as really, really weird. Yeah, fascinating. And as I say, just the context of this, by May of 2016, Jonathan Dowdall's home had already been searched by the Gardaí. They'd gone in, they'd raided the home and they had taken items. At this point in time, he had not been done for the waterboarding, the torture incident, uh, because when the guards uh, found a USB key in Jonathan Dowdle's home, they found this video footage, which he had somebody film of the incident, and that's how he got done over that. Um, So that hadn't yet been prosecuted over that yet. And then also, we know now, Jonathan Dowdle had many interactions with Jerry Hutch. He went up north with Jerry Hutch. The conversation was bugged. And uh, we have heard all about that conversation. And he alleges he met Jerry Hutch in Whitehall. He he alleges that he met Patsy Hutch and Patsy Hutch got him to try and intervene in the feud. All these things have happened. Um, Yet at this point in time in his interview with the guards, uh, he's not indicating any of that. Uh, He is being asked about what do you know about the Regency? Um, But he says that Jerry Hutch would not confide in him, wouldn't tell him about that. He says, yes, they did talk about the feud because Jerry Hutch was li- was living in fear. He said uh, people had been knocking um, at the Hutch's doors. Um, there had been threats made. Uh, obviously, uh, Jerry Hutch's brother, Eddie, had been murdered. So he said, yeah, of course, we discussed that. And he said that we discussed the newspapers and the coverage in the newspapers. Uh, and another interesting thing he said that he was discussing with Jerry Hutch uh, in in he said two or three occasions that Jerry Hutch came to his home um, was uh, in relation to fundraising uh, and in in relation to political parties. But he said that political figures probably wouldn't want to talk about that or wouldn't want to admit that, um, that that they were fundraising for them. Um, He then name dropped Mary Lou MacDonald in relation to that, but didn't give it any further context. That was just dropped and moved on. Uh, we we all kind of had to uh, report as met up afterwards to just try and get some context of that. But he really just, you know, in speaking about political figures, he said the name Mary Lou. But we don't have um further context in relation to that. But I just thought that was interesting that you know he's telling the guards uh that he was fundraising uh, and and that's what he was talking to Jerry Hutch about. Um, to all very innocent, as I say. But he was grilled by Brendan Graham about this throughout the day. Uh, you are trying to tell us, you're alleging um, that there was a confession from Jerry Hutch. So are you lying? Are you lying to the Gardaí? Um, and, and at the crux of it, Jonathan Dowdall says uh, that he wasn't telling the truth. I think that's the way he phrased it. Uh, I wasn't telling the truth, uh, but it wasn't lies. Um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe he's just, you know, that's that's his mindset or whatever. But I don't know if that struck you, Mick. It did. Now, look, as I say, I've been very busy with the, the, the murder of, of, of Private Rooney, but I, I did have a chance to look at some of the copy. <clears throat> and it just struck me as I, I, I just found that. You're saying you're not telling the truth, you're not lying, but you're not telling the truth. So is that some sort of like mental reservation? You're not giving him the full truth or whatever. That was the one of the, one of the things that stood out for me. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, at other points in time when it was stated to Jonathan Dell that he was lying, he did accept then that he was lying, but ultimately his explanation for all of the reasons why he wasn't quote unquote telling the truth to the guards was because he was in fear for his life. And if at that point in time he had told the guards what he knew about the Regency, that he uh, would be murdered or that his family could be murdered. And, and that's why he wasn't being forthcoming with everything that he knew. He insisted that a lot of the things he said to the guards were true, but he just wasn't telling them the full truth, so to speak. I want to read out a couple of these quotes because I just think they're 
like I'm just trying to contextualize and bring it all together because this happened over the course of hours. But throughout these tapes, Jonathan Dowdall said things like, I don't think that man is stupid enough to tell me. Let's be honest. Um, he said that he didn't think that Jerry Hutch was a bad man. He respected him. He said, I respect Jared. Um, that he was somebody in the community that was respected and that if you had a problem and someone was pressing upon you, you could go to Jerry Hutch. Um, and, and, you know, again, here's another quote. He never told me about it. Sure, why would he? I'm not a criminal. I wouldn't say, come here, Jared. Did you do the Regency? He's saying I would never put that question to him. Um, and then, you know, I, and this is one of his answers to Brendan Grehan. In some aspects, I'm not telling the truth. But I'm not telling lies. So look, this guy would, I'll be quite honest with you. As a reporter trying to cover, and especially live tweet, things that he says, he'd give you a headache. Because he's, I didn't tell lies. I'm not telling the truth. He contradicts himself so many times. Um, you're trying to keep up with it. You're trying to accurately report what he's saying. Um, and everyone in the courtroom is trying to keep up with him. Uh, the judges, the defense, all of us are just trying to contact, to, to understand uh, what is it is he's exactly trying to say, because there are many, many um, contradictions. And one of the things when, when he said under guard, uh, uh, questioning that he would never speak to, Jared Hutch about the, the Regency <clears throat> we hear in the tapes that he said effectively he did talk to him he did talk about you know he, re, he, he proactively raised the issue of the Hutch of Hutch being involved in the Regency in the tapes yeah he did bring up uh, in court today he said well it, it, it was it was all on the tapes um, and he, he's pointing that out to the defence uh, that Regardless of you know you're saying I'm lying here, it is on the tapes. Um, the, the, this this particular talk about this is on the tapes. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. But just there, are, there's so much in today. But another thing that really interested uh, me anyway, and I think you would have knowledge of this, Mick, because you can remember from covering the feud. One very interesting thing that's come that that was happening. Uh, throughout the Kinnahan and Hush feud was a bit of a online war, shall we say, where the Hutch side appeared to have control of or involvement with a Twitter account uh, that was tweeting out uh, information, propaganda, that sort of thing. Um, and Jonathan Dowdall makes reference to that uh, in relation to uh, an, an allegation that a Twitter account put out about him uh, saying that he was the organiser of the Regency Hotel attack, uh, that he was paid €250,000 in relation to the procurement of the firearms, uh, the the organising of the firearms. Um, fascinating. I don't know if you can remember his name being put out there on social media, but it, it, or, or, or what specifically that was in reference to. Well, firstly, we, we, you, there was a war. But we have to be honest, we benefited from that war because there were people who were, you know, contacting journalists and given what turned out to be right information. But there was, I mean, I, look, I do, I do remember st some stuff being said about Jonathan Dowdall. I, I have to be honest, I don't remember the €250,000, but I think Dowdall, Jonathan Dowdall's name was put out there in relation to the Regency anyway. And I think even back in the day, his name was doing the rounds in relation. Yeah, so he names this, you know, as an example as to, you know, the threat that he was maybe potentially under. I mean, he, he his name was being put out there. He claims this account was the Hutches. Um, you know, he, he says, uh, if the likes, uh, he said, if I was Liam Byrne and I seen this Twitter account, it's only obvious that they're going to want me dead. Now, to give context to that, Liam Byrne, a member of the Kinahan cartel, a brother of, 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 of slain David Byrne. Um, so he's saying it's only obvious they're going to want me dead uh, if the Kinahans are to believe this information that was being put out about Jonathan Dowdall. Um, and later on, he says that clearly somebody had an agenda. This is, again, falling into Jonathan Dowdall's narrative that he was set up in the whole thing because he says at this time that he was being interviewed by the Gardaí, uh, he wasn't aware who 
was in that Regency Hotel room that uh, him and his father had booked. Um, because Brendan Graham challenged him, you know, well, when you were speaking to the guards and they're asking you about the Regency, did it not occur to you, did it not come into your head that you had booked a room in the Regency um, and that maybe you should have told them about that? But Dowdall is basically sort of saying he didn't think of it because at that point in time, he didn't know that Kevin Murray, uh, flat cap, uh, now deceased, was the person who was booked into that room. They knew that they, they had booked a room, but they didn't realize uh, the significance of that until the guards told them uh, years later. So at that point in time, he didn't bring it up, he said. But this, as I said, falls into uh, Dowdall's claim that he was set up. He says that the hotel room uh, was booked uh, and that they had been put in the frame in relation to that. Um, and, and then the, the stuff that was put out on Twitter he was put in the frame in relation to that. So he, he has a feeling that someone had an agenda against him. Uh, there are three key things that he's complaining about. He says that there was a van that was registered to him that was parked in the Buckingham Village area. So that's the alleged meetup spot of the Regency hit team. Um, he was made to room a book, uh, book a room in the hotel without knowing who would be in it. And then he says this Twitter account named him uh, as being responsible for the attack. He said someone obviously had an agenda and he believed that to be the Hutches. Um, but he also had criticisms in his interview with the Gardaí to the Gardaí. He said, they, you destroyed my fucking life, basically, uh, after they raided his home. Uh, you know, he, his name was put out there. He was associated with the Regency. His life had been turned upside down. Um, the guards said that they wanted to just get the truth of the matter and they, they were there to help him. Uh, and, and they were... Being quite friendly with them this in this particular exchange, I would say. Sorry, can you say one thing, just from my memory of the time, when he went on the, the famous Joe Duffy show, was that not the first time that he was named publicly? Because we, I mean, we knew about it. He certainly wasn't named in any of the media. So surely the first time it became public was when he appeared in the Joe Duffy show. That, that's my memory of it anyway. Yeah, when the house was raided, I think. And then I think that day, or was it the day after? I think the day of he went on the show. Am I wrong? No, no, it wasn't. So say it was, say it was a Tuesday night that the, the search operation yeah. happened in his house. It, it was the following day that it, that he went on Joe Duffy. Because I remember, because we, we, we right. had it. The, well, then it was out first. everywhere. No, no, no. Yeah. I, 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 I'm only giving you my memory, but we certainly didn't. Yeah. We, we, were, we, we were the only ones to have it. And we certainly yeah. didn't name it. We just said a search operation took place. And then it was only the next day you know, say the Wednesday if it was that it that he went on Joe Duffy. So I think it was when he went on Joe Duffy that, you know, everybody started right. talking about him. Interesting. Um and 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 again, just in relation to this interview, it, we, we we heard the portions of this for quite some time, but it, again Jonathan Dowdall says, I, I'm an innocent man. I was never involved in crime in my life ever. Now at that point in time he'd waterboarded a man. <laughs> but uh um, you know, he didn't know that the cops uh, had that, um, and he certainly didn't know that down the road uh, that they were going to be charging him with murder. So I understand earlier in the day, uh, Mr. Graham challenged Jonathan Dowdell as to why he pleaded guilty to facilitating the murder of David Byrne. Yeah, again, this is very interesting because um, Jonathan Dowdell is at pains to say and minimise to an extent his role in uh, the murder itself. He says he wasn't involved in the murder of David Byrne or the Regency incident. So Mr. Graham asked him, well, why did you plead guilty then to facilitating a murder if you had no hand in it? His father booked the hotel room, excuse me, and it was put to him, you know, you didn't actually book the hotel room because John the Dowdle kept saying, I booked the room. Well, it was put to him, you didn't book the room. You said it yourself. And that's in evidence. Your father booked the room and your wife was involved in the booking of the room, but you weren't. And Jonathan Dowdall said, well, I drove, I, I was in the car with my dad when he took the call from Patsy, um, and that he drove his father to the Regency Hotel, waited in the car park, and his dad went in. So he says that his involvement, you know, he was stupid to have gotten involved, and he was reckless. And that's when the charge was read out, it's, it's recklessly being involved in a crime in uh, assisting, a, uh, knowingly assisting a, a criminal organization. Um, and, and so Dowdall uh, um, 
Dowdall basically clarifies that by saying he was reckless in that he should have asked questions and he should have known, but he went along with it and he acted along with it. And in, in, you know, explaining how he knew of the existence of the organized crime group, he said that he was aware that Gary Hutch uh, was involved in crime. Uh, He said he didn't know. He assumed Patsy Hutch was an innocent person at that point in time, he said. Um, But he said, nonetheless, he was reckless and I am guilty and I'm responsible for that. And that's why he pleaded guilty. I think the defense is ultimately trying to say that he got his murder charge dropped. And that's the only reason he's here today. Um, and sort of trying to get to the root of why did he plead guilty if if all he's saying is now I'm Mr. Innocent and all I did was book a hotel room and I didn't even know who was going to be in it. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. And then just at the start of the day, uh, there was an interesting exchange uh, with the judges uh, in in relation <laughs> in relation to, you know, the tapes, because Mr. Grehan wanted to clarify, these are 10-hour tapes. Is the prosecution's case against Mr. Hutch the entirety of the tapes, or is it the specific portion of the tapes that they have put to Jonathan Dowdall uh, this week? Um, and Miss Justice Tara Burns actually got, I would say, quite annoyed about this. And she told Brennan Grehan that he was getting a little, uh, he was on, getting a little too, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but she was she was upset with him for suggesting uh, that there was an issue here because the 10 hour tapes have been ruled admissible as evidence. And she stated that as such, that the entirety of the tapes are the evidence. So, you know, and he thought she thought that he would know that. So now all of a sudden you're trying to make an issue out of this, she was saying. Um, and Mr. Grattan was basically saying, no, I'm just trying to get a clarification from the prosecution. Is there specific portions on the tape that they are using in their evidence against Mr. Hutch? And the only reason I'm raising this as interesting is because Mr. Galan got up and clarified um, that there are spe- there there are specific sections of the tape uh, that are of relevance to his case. And something that I wasn't aware of is that he says uh, that there is a possible a possible confession on the tapes from Jerry Hutch. Now it's a very slight, small moment in a ten-hour tape where Jonathan Dowdall says something to the effect of, "And you didn't tell them." about uh, that that about your about you and the regency or that you were involved in the regency uh and uh jerry says something like yeah ah yeah or something like like a really slight sentence do you remember that at all but i, I do it, yeah it, it it was it was it, it was either yeah or mm-hmm, but it was you know but it wasn't yes it was us it was <clears throat> very 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 subtle so i i i you know that's one of the things that i jumped out at me today the other thing that I was interested in uh if memory serves me right was Jonathan Dowdle challenged about himself not being on CCTV at the Regency yeah uh, Mr Graham said you are you aware that you, you, there's no CCTV of, of of you at because he says he drove his father to the Regency and he parked outside and he waited for him now there is apparently footage of his father uh, but there's no footage of Jonathan Dowdle or his vehicle and it's put to him that there is a camera on the way in and it should have picked him up, but it didn't. Uh, and Jonathan Dowdle didn't have an answer to that. He just said, I, I don't know what to tell you, Mr. Gretton. I was there. Um, you know, and that comes to the heart of him trying to find out why did you plead guilty to this? Um, almost suggesting that he wasn't really there and he, the, the truth of the matter hasn't really been told. That's fascinating. All of this essentially comes down to, and, and uh, Dowdle has obviously copped it because he was getting very annoyed today that he is, uh, the, the defence's case is that Dowdall is an unreliable witness. He's a liar through and through. And at almost every juncture um, over the past two days, Ms. Mr. Gretton has been able to identify occasions where Jonathan Dowdall was lying uh, and, and where Jonathan Dowdall even said to him in court that he was lying on specific occasions, but he's telling the truth now. And I think he did say something to that effect today to Mr. Dowdall. Well, which Jonathan Dowdall are we, are we to believe? The one here in court today or the one that's speaking to the guardie on the tapes or the one that's in the 10 hour tapes, you know, so there are different Jonathan Dowdles. There are different versions of Jonathan Dowdles story. Which one are we to believe? Um, and, and Dowdall, as I said, got quite annoyed. He was annoyed about the fact that we were all sitting there watching him being interviewed by the guardie an exchange that he actually admitted he couldn't remember. Uh, and he actually said, do I have to sit here and listen to this, Mr. Graham? 
Um, and he said, do I have to listen? Specifically, he was he was annoyed about, because in the tape at, at one specific moment, he uh, says, he talks about the fact that him and his, his family, their lives are in danger and he's concerned uh, for their safety. And that was annoying to doubt all in court. Uh, he was saying, do I have to sit here and listen to stuff about my children? And even at one point, he gave out about the media um, and how we may we might maybe cover uh, that specific section and some personal things that were said about his family. Um, and he had to be reminded by the judges that uh, by Miss Justice Tara Burns that, um, you know, you I can't direct the media as to what they report, Mr. Dowdall, um, you know, and it'll be up to them as to what they what portions of what's heard in court they will and won't report. Now, I would say there are two particularly personal matters in relation to Jonathan Dowdall uh, that I have not, I have chosen not to say here uh, or report. Um, I don't think they're relevant to the case. Um, they are personal matters. I, I do think they were said in open court and anyone has the right to report on them. There's no restriction on us, uh, but, but we have, I've made the decision anyway not to say them. I don't know if my my colleagues have, but it, it was put to us by the judge that there was a specific thing um, that maybe we didn't have to uh, report, uh, um, but it was at our own discretion. There is a huge amount of evidence every single day anyway. And, you know, I mean, you, look, you haven't told me what was said and I don't want to know, but, you know, we can't put everything in. We have to try and do our best just to distill it down. But, you know, there are thousands of words said every single day and no newspaper can carry all or no media organisation can carry all of that so you know we have to suppose we have to decide but now so it, was that it for the day or was there anything else yeah I'm gonna uh, maybe I shouldn't but I, I just I'll, I'll tell you about one other thing that gave me a headache uh, <laughs> frankly um, because again uh, Mr Grehan was trying to get to the root of Jonathan Dowdall's supposed identification of Patrick Hutch Jr in that photograph on the Sunday World newspaper. We, to the point where now uh, printed copies of that front page of the Sunday World were handed out uh, and, and one was handed to Jonathan Dowdall. The picture is pixelated of the gunman in drag and the gunman wearing the flat cap and it's put to Jonathan Dowdall, how did you identify this person as Patrick Hutch? And Dowdall says that Jerry Hutch told him it was Patrick Hutch. Um, but it had to be pointed out to him again, as if, like, I don't know how many times it's been said to him now. No, Mr. Dowdall, you have said that you, of your own, on your own, independently identified the person in the photograph as Patrick Hutch, and that he did so on the uh, 8th of February when he met Jerry Hutch in the park, same day Eddie Hutch was murdered, um, 2016, 8th of February, 2016. Uh, and, and Dowdall said, uh, again contradicted himself he said that he did know that it was patrick he did identify it as patrick but then he said i i i didn't identify it as patrick on the 8th of february 2016 so like again i it's just unclear uh what the truth of the matter there is because um he said i did he said i didn't he said i did again um yeah I, but uh he said, "When you see the un, when you see the unpixelated picture, it's clear as day." But the point of it is that he once claimed that in this meeting with Jerry Hutch, that he himself uh, said to Jerry that that he recognised the person as being Patrick. And the defence is saying, "How could you if the picture was pixelated?" And and again, that's just them trying to drill down to is he telling the truth? Because here is an example of of the exact same day where there is doubt over what Jonathan Dowdall is saying. I'm, I'm, I mean, I think it's safe to say that all this will, you know, coalesce in uh, Brendan Grehan's closing speech to the judges where he's going to be pointing out what he sees as flaws in Mr. Dowdall's, uh, you know, evidence. And that's, thankfully, that's not a decision for uh, me or you. It's a decision for the three judges. So. No, uh, I propose to leave it there. As I said, Jonathan Dowd, it is fascinating to watch him. Don't get me wrong. This is blockbuster stuff, but he contradicts himself so much that, as I said, he's liable to give you a headache. And I don't want to give the listeners a headache either. But we are apparently going to have Jonathan Dowd all for a few more days because at the end of things, um, Mr. Graham was asked to give an indication how long more he may be grilling the witness. 
Um, and he's, he said it's probably going to go into next week at this stage, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. It'll have to finish by Wednesday anyway because the courts go on Christmas break uh, then. But I expect to be talking about Jonathan Dowdall well into next week. And then well into the new year because who knows what evidence there is to come and we have all the closing arguments and everything. And then, you know, because it's the special criminal court, it would more than likely be a reserved judgment. So in other words, you know, they'll have to go away and the judges will have to go away and come to their decision. And that could be, you know, it could be quite some time. So, you know, I think there'll be a few more pods to come. Absolutely. But thanks everybody for listening. We really enjoy it and we hope you do too. And we hope we provide you with the, the not only the information about what's going on, but also the context for the whole story the whole story about the Kenan and Hush feud when this murder was obviously a, a central part of that but it, you know there were other aspects as well and we, we do try to you know contextualize matters because it can be hard for everybody to follow but thanks for listening thank you